welcome to today's edition of the Virtual World Biodiversity Forum. We'll talk today about restoring nature, not just for biodiversity, but for climate and people as well. I have the pleasure of introducing you to today's moderator, Professor Carlos Chili. He's Professor of Plant Ecology at the State University of Campinas in Brazil. He was a member of the IPBES Multidisciplinary Expert Panel. He was involved in various assessments of IPBES as well as the Capacity Building Task Force. And currently he's the Chair of the Biotech Capacity Program, Co-Chair of the Brazilian Platform on Biodiversity, Ecosystem, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. He's a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research and a Fellow of the Brazilian Academy of Science. So welcome. Carlos, and thank you so much for moderating the session today. Oh, thank, you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Cornelia, for inviting me and uh, for giving me the role of a moderator in this session that I think uh, is going to be a very interesting session in this uh, uh, Global Biodiversity uh, Forum. Uh, we all know that uh, if we uh, produce global map as maps of human population and land use over the past thousand of years, uh, we'll show that nearly three quarters of the terrestrial nature has long been shaped by diverse histories of human habitation and use. Uh, archaeological and paleoecological evidence shows that all human societies employed varying degrees of ecologically transformative land use practices including burning, hunting, species propagation, domestication, cultivation, and others that have left long-term legacies across the biosphere. The current biodiversity crisis is due to a great intensification of use of natural resources, converting areas to intensive use due to pollution, invasive species, and last, but perhaps on the, one of the most powerful drivers, climate change. Uh, in the last decade, restoration has popped up as a win-win solution that would simultaneously benefit both biodiversity and climate change. And we have seen big restoration projects starting all over the world. One of them is a very controversial program, the Grain to Green in China, uh, that is most the planted forests, monocultures, or simply mixed forests. But we have other very good examples in Europe, more than 400 projects. And to talk about those projects, we will have the pleasure of receiving uh, Franz Shepers. He is the CEO of Reward in Europe. And they work with the uh, say that rewarding is about trusting the forces of nature to restore land and sea. Also about Europe, we are going to have Pietro Visconti from IASA. Pietro has been working with uh, scenarios, particularly to promote biodiversity recovery scenarios in EU. Uh, we also have a lot, a lot of projects that are being developed by UNEP or are being supported by UNEP. One of them is UNEP's Green Wall in Africa. Uh, and to talk about the role of UNEP in restoration, we're going to have the participation of Lera Myos. Uh, she's planning team at UNEP WCMC, works with maps, special data, and their effective use in decision maker. Uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, my side of the Atlantic, on the Brazilian Atlantic Forest, uh, we have the Brazilian Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact. And to talk about that, we have uh, Jean-Paul Metzger from the University of Sao Paulo, who is a landscape, landscape ecologist and has been working with landscape fragmentation and reconnectation. The Brazilian PAC has one of the uh, largest aim in terms of restoration uh, in South America. And uh, to give uh, a, a sense of what the youth uh, can bring to this discussion, we have the participation of Mirna Fernandes of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. So uh, without further delay, uh, I will ask uh, Franz Shepers from Rewarding Europe 
as a keynote speaker. Please, uh, friends, the floor is yours. Well, uh, really nice to be uh, able to uh, give a keynote here on what of the work we're doing in Europe uh, when it comes to uh, restoring la functional landscapes, as we, as we say, and rewilding as a more broad term. And I realize very much that uh, we have a global audience. So this is, a, is an example from Europe. And I really hope that this example from Europe can inspire others across the world uh, uh, thinking along, along the lines as we have been developing. Rewilding Europe is, a, is actually a young initiative. We only exist uh, for nearly 10 years. And um, we uh, sort of jumped uh, on this opportunity that we saw for Europe um, to start uh, bringing back nature. And I will explain a little bit more. And I took this species here, and some of you might know it, it's the Iberian lynx. And the Iberian lynx was nearly extinct, and it would have been the first cat species in the world that would have gone extinct in Europe, in our backyard, uh, since the sable-toothed tiger. And that would be, of course, an incredible shame. And for me, this species, which lives in, in the south of Spain and Portugal now as well, is a, is, is a sign of the resilience that nature has. And we can allow nature to bounce back. Now we have, I think, over 800 Iberian lynx, and they're really spreading. And um, it was a huge effort. But we, we see those, that, that species now moving away from the brink of extinction. So that's the symbol, in fact, of my, my talk here. Is, it's about resilience of nature, and nature being our best ally in many different ways. OK. Um, well, if you talk about rewilding, it's a fairly new term. 10 years ago, it wasn't even used in Europe. I know it was in other parts of the world, but for Europe, it was completely new. And uh, just two years ago, we had the first scientific article uh, publication in science, what is rewilding? It was an, an, a publication that presented for the first time, you know, the, the sort of uh, the concept and, and, and the framework behind rewilding, which was very important. Uh, for us. But at the same time, we saw also publications in like this one saying, you know, what is new about rewilding? We're doing this already. You know, the, the restoration agenda has been there for a long time. So an interesting debate sort of started in Europe. And we saw many, many publications, basically the scientific publications, most of them were opinion, uh, opinion papers. We saw them skyrocketing and even sort of looking at questions like, well, maybe this is a new paradigm for conservation in Scotland. And some of you might know that Scotland now is even trying to rally for becoming the first rewilding nation on earth. So um, we saw an incredible development around the whole theme of rewilding. And I'm sure you know this person, but um, in his latest film, Alive on Our Planet, it was Sir David Attenborough saying that we must rewild the world. And if big influences like him, but also Greta Thunberg, and recently Leonardo DiCaprio are talking about rewilding, you know, you can, you can imagine we are on something that is apparently really speaking to many, many, many people. And that is very encouraging uh, from our point of view. And just to show you a little uh, overview of books that have been presented recently, uh, uh, published recently about rewilding in French and Spanish, you know, from the US, from Europe, in Swedish, and also on the science side. So we see this, this upsurge of, of rewilding. And, um, and that's, that's interesting and encouraging. And um, just to, to now move to the situation in Europe where there are a few important trends that, that actually made our initiative sort of start off. Myself, I've been working in conservation my whole life across many parts of the world through my work in WWF um, and now working in, in Europe. And, um, and there is a few particular trends that are relevant for, for my story here. And one of them, which is of course something that is familiar to many regions in the world, is rural depopulation or if you like urbanization. Uh, but at the same time here in Europe, it comes very strongly with an aging population. And this means that if you look at some of these figures, that four out of five Europeans by now live in urban areas, that there is still a lot of land going to be abandoned because of this rural depopulation. And the main reason is that young people, in particular younger generations, move to the urban areas and they go to university and they, they don't want to become a, a, sh a shepherd or an olive picker or, or anything. And so many of these landscapes and areas that, that are being left abandoned are actually very marginal uh, uh, lands from an agricultural perspective. And of course, that has a huge socioeconomic impact, you know, and cultural losses as well. And it's widely seen as a big problem. On this map here, you see the levels of land abandonment across Europe from a, a study some eight years ago. And you see like 
northeast of Portugal, you know, very high levels of, of people leaving, leaving the countryside. And this, of course, changes also the relationship between man and nature, because urban people have different views and maybe are more relaxed to some of the things that we're talking about here today than people on the countryside. And, um, and there is, because people live more in urban areas, there's a huge interest to, uh, f you know, to go out and see wildlife and be out in nature. So uh, important developments that have, you know, that, that are very relevant for European context. And if you go to some of these areas, like this village in Spain, you know, the, this is, these are the, the, the old ladies that are staying behind in those villages where lots of houses are for sale. And this is widely regarded as a huge social economic problem. And you have to realize that with people leaving, and a lot of the people were, uh, were shepherding and were having, you know, Europe used to have huge numbers of livestock grazing out there, uh, sheep, cows, horses, goats, you name it. And we see with the people leaving also, those domestic animals are leaving the countryside. And, you know, as we already um, sort of, uh, the wild, the wild large herbivores have disappeared, uh, most of them in large numbers, and even some of them got extinct in Europe. You, you have to realize that for the first time of, uh, um, in the history of Europe, since the Pleistocene, a lot of areas are, don't have large herbivores anymore. And, uh, and that has an impact on the landscape. And we sometimes say it creates a sort of digital landscape because the areas that are very suitable for agriculture become like ecological deserts. Nothing is there anymore. Um, and the Netherlands is an example of that, unfortunately, the country where I live. And we see areas that had this small scale agricultural landscape that are becoming sort of overgrown with young forest. And, um, and, and so, and all the gradients in between, they are actually in disappearing. And if you look at Europe's biodiversity, maybe 60% or more of the species we have, think about birds, butterflies, reptiles, mammals, they are depending on everything in between, let's say bare soil and closed canopy forest. So the natural vegetation of Europe is not, not forest, it's actually lots of different habitat types, of course. And if you look at, um, you know, and this is a study we did together with a number of uh, organizations and scientific uh, uh, institutions, look at this picture of the degradation of European landscapes when it comes to ecological integrity. And, um, and you see the more yellow, red and orange, uh, the, the more degraded it is. And, you know, the really high nature sort of value in terms of ecological integrity is up in the north and some of the mountainous areas. By the way, there is a mistake in this map for Corsica and, um, What's the other island? I forgot. <laughs> in the south, in the Mediterranean. But you know, this is the state where we are in Europe. And um, of course, everyone is aware uh, uh, of how are we going to bend this curve? How can we restore? You know, is there apart from downgrading? Is there also a way for upgrading back again? And this is, of course, the topic of of today. And you have to realize that Europe has an incredible network of of sort of EU designed protected areas, which is called the Natura 2000 network. But you also have to realize that a lot of ways of how we Europeans manage nature is very intense. It's, it's a lot about controlling and managing and mowing and plowing and planting. And you can imagine that, you know, with this network, uh, which is around 19% of, of Europe's uh, EU member state surface, you will never to be able to pay for it. And, and only, it's only a very small budget is actually available for this type of management. And it's maybe also very unnatural to do this. And of course, if, if, there's, if there's no way to finance this, you can do two things. You can ask for more money, which is something we need, but we will never be able to cover that gap. Or you start doing things different. And maybe this is where rewilding could come in. Because if you allow natural processes to, to play a role much more in these landscapes, maybe that would lead to much less human intervention and costs. So at the same time, despite the degradation, we also saw a spectacular wildlife comeback. And some of these iconic species that lots of people thought in the, let's say in the 1990s or, or 70s or 80s, they will go extinct. They will not make the new millennium, but look at what happened. We had an incredible wildlife comeback of many iconic species. And the study we did uh, in 2013 with the Zoological Society of London and BirdLife and others, you know, we, we mapped uh, at the, the, this comeback and tried to see how can we learn from these success stories? Why are they happening? And, and how can we have more of it? Because this is a positive story as opposed to, you know, the big wildlife um, uh, crisis and, and decreases that we see across the world. 
And, um, and I can tell you that the main reasons are uh, uh, legal protection, the EU Habitats and Birds Directive are very strong pieces of legislation, and a lot of dedicated conservation work, both on habitats and species. So this is something to really share. And, and as I was talking about urban people becoming more relaxed to people, it's also vice versa. These are pictures from Berlin, where there's around 4,000 wild boar just in the outskirts of Berlin. And if you bring your children to school in the morning, this is what you can what you can see. And we also see in Europe that nature tourism, wildlife tourism in particular, is very fast growing. And it's a huge opportunity to, uh, to link people back with, uh, with, let's say, the iconic uh, wildlife that we used to have in Europe. And seeing a, an animal like this, not in a zoo, but it, you know, alive, Europe has, if I count European Russia, we have 25,000 brown bears. And there is a, you know, this big opportunity to to, to, to develop wildlife tourism and seeing these animals, of course, in a, in a, in a respected way. So when you look at rewilding, I, I, uh, I would like to say that there are a few differences with, call it, let's call it more traditional ways of conservation. So the biggest points of difference I would say are um, that it appreciates, you know, uh, wild nature in Europe, again, a, a, a continent which has been very much human dominated. It's a new and positive appreciation of wild nature. It looks at biodiversity, not as people managing for certain species, but as a result of natural processes. It's very much future oriented, not going back to the past. It is more cost effective compared to recurrent management where people have to intervene year by year, but it also allows us to reconnect or to connect modern society with wild nature through nature-based economies. So maybe new opportunities for those regions where land abandonment is, ha what is happening. And it's important to say that it's not trying to create wilderness. It's really moving up the scale of wildness, whether it's in a city park or a larger landscape. You can scale, you, you, and, you know, moving up that scale is, uh, is progress. And, um, and of course, there is a link with climate. And luckily, we see in the last few years, uh, you know, after the Paris Agreement, that connection being made more and more. And I really hope this is going to uh, to, to happen much stronger. And when we talk about biodiversity as, as a link to climate, we should not only look at protection, but we should look at, of course, restoration. And climate, uh, the climate sort of movement could maybe be the, one of the best levers for large scale nature recovery across the world and also in Europe. And uh, we see that already happening um, in, uh, in EU policy, for instance, looking at the EU Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy. And, um, and we need not only the public sector involved here, but also the financial and, and the corporate sector. We'll talk about that later. So what we do as Rewilding Europe, we have this big, bold vision about uh, Europe, making Europe a wilder place. But we also said we want to demonstrate this in different parts of Europe. So we got nominations from regions that wanted to be part of this. And we started working now, you know, eight, seven, six years ago. And we have a, a portfolio of eight large landscapes, and there's two more coming where we are putting our vision into practice. And uh, these are our sort of demonstration areas where we focus on specific themes and where the, uh, and, and, and these are initiatives, not projects, uh, but these are long-term commitments where we're trying to make this transition in these landscapes driven um, by local, local teams that we get support from us. And just to give you a few examples, um, but before I do that, I just want to show you that sort of the key interventions that we do in those landscapes are, uh, you know, trying to bring these natural processes back, whether it's flooding, whether it's natural grazing, whether it's, uh, you know, restoring food chains with interactions with between wildlife and landscape, is uh, supporting wildlife come back, and that happens mostly by itself. Sometimes you have to help species. We hope this provides a new base for those regions, uh, you know, for for, for nature-based economies. And that will create, and we can see that already happening, new pride and identity for those regions. And we hope this inspires others to adopt this idea. And um, to give you, uh, um, uh, sorry, I, I continue here. So uh, it's really nice to have these demonstration sites where we look at how could rewilding uh, be a competitive form of land use and how can we build those, those new coalitions with all sorts of partners, which we do across Europe. Um, that is, that is absolutely uh, uh, important. Um, we need an enabling policy for rewilding to happen, large scale nature recovery. And that is actually happening, as I mentioned to you, apart from the EU Green Deal and the biodiversity strategy, there is a restoration 
directive, so uh, which means that EU member states will face legally binding targets to, uh, to, to restore land. There is a huge opportunity, we believe, to connect with the private sector and financial markets. We see much a, a lot of corporates, but also uh, the financial sector that are looking for new business models that actually improve uh, the quality of our forests or our wetlands. And um, instead of just exploiting it, and uh, I can mention some examples later if you like. And so we need, we need large scale investments to make that happen and, and to, to bring in the private sector to, to take its share. And of course, there's a very important link with, this, with science where we're looking at how can we learn by doing uh, because there is a, a sense of urgency. We can't study for many, many years and then maybe act. We need to act and learn from it. So we're very much um, uh, looking at this, you know, uh, as practitioners, because that's what we are in rewilding Europe. And we work with a lot of universities. And we recently, last year, we started the first rewilding ecology chair at Wageningen University. So lots of things that, um, that we're doing. And just to give you a few examples, so in Portugal, we are restoring a large scale sort of wildlife corridor and Mediterranean forest that has been overgrazed, but where there's big land abandonment. And because of this lack of grazing, there's huge risk of fire. You know, Portugal is a country that has huge fires, not only because of uh, eucalyptus and pine plantations, but also because grazing is missing. And we are we're doing all sorts of things to build that local economy. Um, the other one is just a completely different ecosystem, but Europe's biggest uh, sort of uh, river delta, the delta of the Danube, which is a biosphere reserve, where we're restoring flooding, former polders that, that, that failed. Uh, we are reflooding them again by just removing dikes and dams and restoring fish populations, which is the basis of the whole ecosystem, is, is on wetlands and wetland dynamics and fish. And there's huge opportunities and already happening uh, on, on, on tourism and na uh, building a nature-based economy. And the third example is in Italy, in the central Apennines, just one and a half hour drive from Rome, where we are working with large, what we call coexistence corridors that connect different national parks, and uh, which also allow wildlife to, to spread to other parks, in particular, the Masik and brown bear. And we've set some very new and innovative finance mechanisms and, and entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial mechanisms for uh, for the local local communities and, and and people who live in this area. Apart from our own areas, we have set up a network because there are many smaller rewilding initiatives across Europe, and this is what we call the European Rewilding Network, with now 65 members, all working on 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 restoring and and rewilding. And we we facilitate exchange of experience with webinars and, and physical meetings. And and this network is growing, you know, all the time. And it's really encouraging to see this, this, this taking place. Um, and then making a step to the global uh, sort of arena, because recently this year, we saw the start of the Global Rewilding Alliance. Uh, you should have a look at their website. And it was actually based on uh, the Global Rewilding Charter that was put together as a result of Wild 11, which was supposed to take place in India, but due to COVID couldn't happen. But a big outcome was that a number of organizations sat together and, and, and built this global charter for rewilding the earth, something you should also have a look at if you're interested and download, which is now signed by 120 members. And the idea is uh, of the, the Global Rewilding Alliance and using the charter to really accelerate and mobilize a global community for rewilding the earth, as David Attenborough told us to do. And, um, and of course, there's a big link with the UN decade um, there is now also the first World Rewilding Day was sort of a launch, and, and we as Rewilding Europe are very active um, in this group, and it's really nice to work with our peers in South America, North America, Africa, India, Australia, to get this sort of rolling. And um, my last slide here is, um, it's about a young rewilders community that was setting up in Europe, and they were, they came together recently, and they put sort of the, the key words for them. Uh, on, on a slide and you know this sort of word, word, word landscape and these are some of the things that 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 really inspire them and um, I think it's really important that all the young people that face this future and um, are ang angry and, and also maybe scared about what is going to happen that there is a perspective and we should be very careful with just talking doom and gloom there is a way to restore nature and, and to build a future. And we need to move away from this anxiety narrative to what we call an empowerment narrative, where we provide the tools 
and and the opportunities for young people to join in and um, and 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 take a role in in their own future by helping to restore nature for for people for climate and for biodiversity and with this i would like to end my presentation thank you very much thank you very much franz uh, very inspiring initial uh, comments and presentation for the discussion we are going to do certainly uh, you and your organization are the ones that have uh, uh, more experience and hands-on in terms of uh, doing the work on different countries in europe on uh, rewilding uh, for a long time from you you started that when you see at the wwf uh, and uh, it's uh, very nice to see how this work has progressed uh, in europe uh, I'll give the floor back uh, to Cornelia, so that Cornelia will go and present the other panelists. Okay, thank you very much, um, Carlos. Thanks very much, Franz, for a very interesting presentation. I keep getting flashbacks of the wolf that's been running around just outside Zurich, and everybody's getting really excited about him, <laughs> apart from the sheep farmers <laughs> up the road. <laughs> so, yes. So, Yes, now it's my turn to, to um, Carlos actually already did um, shorter introductions of the panelists. So what I'll do, I'll hand over um, to our four panelists and just ask them to give a quick um, response to Franz's talk, but also to share their, their views uh, on the topic. And um, I'm going to take my pick here. Maybe I'm actually starting with Myrna because actually Franz, he ended his talk um, addressing the young generation. So maybe you want to start. That's very good. Yes. Thanks a lot, Cornelia. And thanks a lot, Franz, for a very uh, insightful and beautiful presentation. Indeed. I think that that's a very good example of how things should be done in the right way. And well, my name is Mirna Fernandez. I am an environmental engineer. My master's is on tropical biodiversity and ecosystems, and I am from Bolivia. I represent the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, which is the a youth constituency to the Convention on Biological Diversity on the, uh, of the UN, the CBD. And I am a steering committee member of the, youth, uh, of the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, and I work with the policy team. Um, I think that uh, as being the youth constituency to the CBD, we have uh, very focused positions on the policy, especially at the biodiversity side, but we also have interactions with the youth community uh, that works with the climate convention or with the desertification convention or with UNEP. So we have a lot of exchange because between these global youth uh, constituencies, and we are trying to get unified positions towards a uh, restoration of nature-based solutions and all these uh, topics that are going to be discussed and that are gaining momentum, especially now with the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So right now we don't have a, a unified position because we're building one. We're developing a global survey. We developed an information brief. And uh, I think that there are many things that we consider that a uh, should be addressed in the biodiversity and the climate spaces at least uh, before defining and implementing uh, initiatives as uh, restoration and nature-based solutions, especially regarding safeguards. Uh, we share a lot of concerns about the misuse, for example, of the term uh, nature-based solutions because it is not defined under any multilateral agreement. Uh, we have really good definitions from the European Union, for example, and the definition from IUCN that is the most widely used. And the standards that the IUCN has developed for nature resolutions are really interesting. But uh, since they are not adopted yet in the CBD or in the UNFCCC, we fear that we might face a lot of misuse of the term. And as it has been happening a lot before, we have a lot of uh, a corporate uptake, we might say, uh, from the term. Uh, from nature solutions and from restoration, um, that is uh, justifying a lot of uh, biodiversity offsetting. And these approaches like the net uh, 
the, the biodiversity net gain or the no net loss uh, that are being discussed, we fear that they can also be misused because you cannot really um, allow to for a big portion of nature to be destroyed uh, and say that you are going to compensate in another side of the world. Uh, offsetting uh, and monoculture schemes have been uh, uh, spreading around the world in a very alarming way. So we do think that in in all these discussions, we need safeguards for biodiversity, for people, for human rights, uh, for the free, pri free, prior, and informed consent of indigenous peoples and local communities. So I think that all of these uh, things are coming uh, very strong in our discussions and young, as young people. But for sure, we think that all of this uh, needs to be addressed, needs to be discussed, and we need to be, make uh, things right regarding a restoration, rewilding, nature-based solutions, because we do need a degraded ecosystems to be restored. But we also need a, our pristine ecosystems or the, bio, or, or the ecosystems that deliver key a, ecosystem functions and ecosystem services for the local people to be preserved that we cannot, let, we cannot allow further destruction. So I'll, I'll guess I'll, I'll keep talking about these points later, but that's an introduction. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mirna. And I think you've given me an excellent opportunity to just jump over to, to Lyra and actually continue on this because I think a lot of your work actually revolves around this. Hey, thanks, Cornelia. So, yes, I'm based at the UN Environment Programme World Conservation Monitoring Centre, which is in the UK. And it's just fab to see the people here from all over the world today. 204 at test down there. So yes, we are, as Mina said, we're now at the start of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, which has UNEP and FAO as its lead agencies. And that decade does aim to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide, focused on achieving existing goals and targets and commitments. So the decade doesn't come along with new goals and targets of its own. But countries have made substantial commitments to restore in all kinds of fora, ranging from the Convention on Combating Desertification through to the Bond Challenge on Forest Landscape Restoration. And now the challenge is to live, uh, delivering on these commitments, yes, in a meaningful way that really is restorative. I do note that those existing commitments are largely for the land rather than for the sea, which covers 70% of our planet. And while I'm not a marine expert, it seems likely to me that we would benefit from having some similar kinds of pledges and targets for marine and coastal ecosystems. The decade does take a wide view of restoration. So it's the process of halting and reversing degradation, resulting in improved ecosystem services and biodiversity. It includes the kind of rewilding that we were hearing about from France, um, but it can include also quite a wide continuing continuum of practices depending on local conditions and local choices. So you can restore an ecosystem that's a degraded natural ecosystem back to a more intact natural ecosystem, say by assisting natural regeneration. You can restore a degraded modified ecosystem like a farmland back to a natural ecosystem, e.g. through rewilding, but also we'd call it restoration if you were taking a modified ecosystem like a farmland and restoring it so that it's more functional, so through agroforestry or say even restoration within urban areas. So the, the UN decade intends to be a big tent encouraging lots of participation in ecosystem restoration across the board. And yes, my organization, UNEP World Conservation Monitoring Center is supporting the wider UNEP in its work on the decade, helping to bring a biodiversity perspective, um, helping to prepare for the formal launch, which will be on the 5th of June, World Environment Day. So you can find lots of information on that if you just do a quick Google on World Environment Day or the decade. And then finally, just to give a bit of my own background on nature-based solutions, it has been focused on climate change mitigation action um, making sure that that does deliver co-benefits and avoids risks. And historically, I've worked quite a lot in the context of reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, Red Plus, which also includes forest conservation, sustainable management, and the enhancement of forest carbon stock. So restoration is part of the work that countries have been doing on Red Plus, and I can speak a bit more about that today. Particularly, our group supported countries on their safeguard systems, non-spatial planning for Red. 
But on a landscape scale in Europe, we've also been working in various ways with the Endangered Landscapes Programme, which funds some of the exciting work mentioned by France. And we've been looking, for example, whilst these are big projects focus on biodiversity, we've been looking at some of the climate change mitigation benefits that can be coming out of those and trying out different tools to assess these. And then finally, we're also collaborating extensively with Piero's team and others on spatial prioritization work, but I know that Piero is going to say a bit about that, um, identifying where to conserve or to restore to get those joint benefits for climate and for nature at different scales. I'm looking forward really very much to hearing the rest of you and uh, to participating in today's panel. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Lyra. And I think I'll just hand over to Piero Fumiaza now. Um, Lyra giving him such a nice introduction. Thanks for the first, Lyra. <laughs> um, thanks for inviting me and for the opportunity to talk. Uh, um, I'll jump straight to it. Um, so the, the topic of today is about restoration and conservation for biodiversity, climate and people. And uh, one immediate question that may come is are these agenda compatible? Is it even possible to rescue biodiversity and avoid dangerous level of climate change and uh, do it for the benefit of people? And the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, the climate and biodiversity agenda not only can, but must come together if you want to avoid dangerous level of climate change and avert a six max extinction. Only through conserving and restoring natural ecosystems, we have a chance to uh, keep global warming within 1.5 degrees, but this need to be done strategically. A recent paper led by Bernardo Strasburg uh, that involved at Solera, myself and many others in the audience, found that strategically targeting for restoration 15% of converted land, an area approximately the size of uh, twice of uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, could avoid 60% of expected extinctions while sequestering 300 gigatons of CO2. This is equivalent of 15% of anthropogenic CO2 emission from the Industrial Revolution and over two thirds of the carbon budget that we have left to give us a substantial chance of limiting global warming within one and a half degrees. In other words, restoring these ecosystems can buy us time to help decarbonize in the global economy. A similar study focused on conservation rather than restoration led by Martin Jung here at YASA found that the top 30% of terrestrial land will be able to conserve 61% of the estimated carbon stock, 66% of all clean water regulation, in addition to meeting conservation targets for 58% of all species. And the synergies between these agenda do not stop on land. Enrique Sala a National Geographic and colleagues found that strategic conservation of 21% of the world oceans, including coastal areas and the ICs, can rescue from extinction 80%, over 80%, of endangered um, and critically endangered marine species. And due to the spillover effect of uh, these marine protected areas, um, the amount of uh, uh, commercially fished uh, species that could be fished increased by 5.9 million metric tons. In other words, if you protect the right places of land and the seas, um, the amount of harvest in this particular instance, uh, the amount of sustainably fished uh, 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 stocks uh, could increase more than if you allowed fleets to fish anywhere they wanted. And it doesn't end here. Trolling today emit 1.5 billion tons of CO2 from disturbing seafloor sediments that are rich in carbon. This is about 15 to 20% of all CO2 that the oceans absorb every year. If we protect only 3.6% of most carbon rich sediments that are currently bottom trolled, we could reduce this a vast amount of emission by 90%. Um, I've given a bunch of numbers here, but I'm going to put the, the, the papers that, uh, that actually provide all this evidence in the chat here so that you can see for yourself. And so these statistics also do not come from different configuration of nature-based solution. They actually come from spatial plants of habitat conservation and restoration on land and in the oceans that target multiple benefits at once. So climate mitigation, biodiversity conservation, clean water provisioning, and food security all can be achieved jointly together. It is possible to achieve these ambitious environmental goals for nature and people, but it requires immediate action. It requires decision makers to use objective, transparent, and evidence-based criteria. And it requires decision makers working with stakeholders, as well as scientists, including scientists, um, to focus on the desired outcomes, not just on the actions. Thanks again, and happy to answer any questions afterwards. 
Okay, thanks very much, Piero. And actually, thank you very much to also highlighting that we're not just talking about the terrestrial ecosystem, but we actually really need to consider um, the marine ecosystems and the freshwater ecosystems as well. So thanks very much for reminding us that. Um, going back to the other side of the globe, I'm handing over to Sean Paul Metz, who's actually been spending most of his career working on landscape ecology, ecosystem restoration in, in Brazil. So Jean Paul, over to you. Thank you, Cornelia. I'm very pleased to be in this panel and to see the presentation from France, very good presentation, and to see all, all those colleagues working with very nice things. So as Cornelia just said, I'm from Brazil, uh, the University of Sao Paulo. I, my main background is on landscape ecology. I'm much more known as a fragmentation guy, so I uh, work a lot about the negative effects of uh, deforestation, fragmentation on biodiversity and trying to understand how we can manage to have better designs of landscape in the way that we can at the same time have activities, economic activities in agricultural landscape, but also conserving most of the biodiversity. Um, and I think that this idea of having healthier landscape designs uh, is uh, we can achieve this through restoration and through nature-based solution. So more recently, I work with the positive effect of nature on uh, uh, hum human health or uh, well-being uh, through ecosystem service. So trying to understand the links between uh, the landscape structure, the ecosystem service, and how these affect positively uh, people. And I think that um, by balancing the negative and the positive effects, uh, we, we can manage to have better landscape. So uh, when we talk about uh, so restoration, nature restoration as a way to, to maintain biodiversity or restore biodiversity to avoid climate change or mitigate climate change and to have benefit to people, I really think that nature-based solutions are the way that we can do that because those solutions, they are based on ecosystem service. They are supported by ecosystem service. And in that way, they, they can be more effective, less costly and more resilient. Uh, and I like the image from France of the links. Uh, so we need to have more resilient landscape. And Taking together uh, restoration and nature-based solution, I think if we really want to scaling up uh, restoration activities, it's not through active planting, it's too expensive. So we need to, to, to take advantage of natural processes and we need to stimulate regeneration, um, uh, natural regeneration. So we need to facilitate a natural regeneration. So this is the way I think that we will be scaling up at the global level, those restoration initiatives. And I think also that through this uh, stimulation of nat natural regeneration, we can also create corridors, we can stimulate rewilding. Uh, so not introducing species, but allowing them to move, to migrate mm -hmm. and to recolonize areas. So, uh, so first thing that I would like to, to stress is that natural regeneration, how we can stimulate the natural rege regeneration is really important. In the Atlantic forest, we, we, we did some st estimation and we obtained six to 700,000 hectares restored in mm -hmm. only five years through natural regeneration. So it's not active plantation. So it's a lot of potential there. And second point, I think, it's important to stress that we usually think about restoration uh, with uh, 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 oriented to biodiversity or to uh, carbon sequestration. But nowadays we have a lot of other synergies and especially now we know that restoration can also uh, 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 avoid the spread of some disease. So I think it's really important not only to think about restoration based on biodiversity or climate or carbon, 
but also to think about other co-benefits that we can have through restoration, especially with disease regulation, which is now a really important issue. And usually when we think about restoration, we think about rural agricultural landscape. Mm -hmm. And I think we need also to, as Franz just said, so most people live now in cities and we need to think about cities. And usually the term restoration is not applied to cities, but um, they talk about uh, nature rewilding, not na uh, renaturing uh, cities or uh, regreening cities. Um, this is part of the restoration uh, topic in, in a wild sense. And I think we, we, we need to understand better. So how uh, increasing the green and blue infrastructure in cities, how this can avoid, for example, a uh, heat island, or how this can avoid floods, uh, important floods, or how this can decrease the pollution of the air, and, and so on. So we have a lot to think about restoration in cities, even if we use another term as renaturing. Uh, but is where people are now living and where people are interacting with nature is in city. So uh, we need to, to have strategy both in, in agricultural landscape, but also in cities. So just for beginning, I, 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 I would like to, to say those few ideas and, and see now how the debate will evolve. Thank you, Camille, again. Thank you. And with that, I hand over to Carlos to start to delve into the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for all panelists for their comments uh, that I'm sure will be uh, a lot of food for the discussions that we are going to start now. Uh, I have a first question that uh, I would uh, direct it uh, first for the comments of Piero. Uh, because there is something on the synergies that were already mentioned by uh, Jean-Paul, but uh, with another connection, with another bias. So uh, nature-based solutions are often only seen as tools to mitigate climate change and to address biodiversity loss. What are other areas or other problems where nature-based solutions would be employed? How can synergies be created? And I'll link that with the pandemic and with a question that was presented by Clara Faircom. If you think that recovering from the pandemic, from the COVID-19 crisis, we still continue seeing the land abandoned as people move into the city, or would it be that more young people move back to the countryside? Could you pack this together in a comment, uh, Piero? Yes, thanks, Carlos. So indeed, uh, a uh, nature-based solution can be effectively uh, used as in nature conservation and restoration to mitigate risk of a spillover event. So um, uh, the majority of emerging diseases, so in fact, 70% of them, uh, I'm thinking uh, Zika virus, Ebola, NIFA. So all uh, uh, viruses that emerged and spill over to humans in the last years and nearly all pandemics um, HIV, uh, COVID-19 are zoonoses. So they basically are caused by microbes or by animal origins. And has been found that there is a uh, strong evidence that the species that carry these, uh, these, these viruses tend to adapt better than others in uh, human dominated landscapes. In fact, habitat loss and degradation has been the main cause of more than 30% of new diseases reported uh, since 1960, for instance, Zika virus and Nifa and Andro virus and has increased the number of infection by others like dengue fever, Lassa fever, and malaria. In fact, there is an interesting part of uh, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, uh, um, that has been spared from Lassa fever just because uh, there is a large national park that also happens to be the last uh, refuge from, uh, for pygmy, hippo, and chimpanzee. I'm not suggesting that we should uh, stop deforestation everywhere, um, um, or, or, or sustainably managed uh, um, uh, um, 
ecosystems and stop farming. I'm just suggesting that uh, we should be strategic about this and make sure that we uh, have an equilibrium between uh, healthy ecosystems and uh, extractive and productive human activities. I think, I think that uh, we are also seeing a lot of uh, the discussion uh, of these uh, connections here uh, in Brazil uh, while we are going through this uh, terrible crisis on the on the pandemic. And, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion on how this uh, keeping the forest or keeping nature or restoring nature uh, could be uh, help or avoid uh, the spread of new diseases, not this particular one that's already uh, took over with the world, but new diseases. Uh, friends, uh, I'll have a question here that I may direct to you. Yeah. Uh, Nature-based solutions for the people with the people. What is the role of different sectors of society in restoration and conservation efforts? Who are the actors? Who has the expertise? Who should be involved? You mentioned that in your uh, presentation, but the question here is, how can we also make use of indigenous and local community uh, knowledge? Uh, and should they play a special role in that? Yeah, let, let me say, you know, that it's more about people than anything, you know, it's about letting nature bounce back and, and use, use nature as an ally to solve lots of these problems. But really, that's what we see in Europe. It's, it's about people. And it starts in the minds of people, you know, the notion that this is a, a, a different way of looking at things. And, uh, and then, of course, how do you mobilize? How do you engage people? And when we started with our, you know, ideas and big vision for Europe, um, was a lot about communication and making people aware of, of, of the opportunities uh, that are there. And um, so if you think about a paradigm shift in thinking, then you know there is a lot of, of communication involved. Um, and of course, ultimately it's about uh, a combination of things, I think, to make things happen. It's the timing. I think we're now in a, in a period of time with the UN decade with the with a, with a crisis of, for climate and biodiversity but, and the COVID, all of these things come together uh, where people start realizing at all, at all levels, you know, what, what's happening and what, what and, and start to think about what we need or can do about it, like you just explained for Brazil. And, um, and you know, when it comes to protecting or restoring nature, at least if I speak for the European context, it's very much people look at, oh, that's the responsibility of the government you know, the public, we pay tax and the public sector will, will put the protection and, and that's fine. And, uh, and of course, there's an important role for, for the public sector and, and uh, for EU and national governments when it comes to policy and regulatory um, frameworks and, and finance, all of that. But I also think there is huge role for the private sector who has been left out to a big extent and, uh, and the financial sector. We see really things moving there. Uh, looking at the financial sector, number of banks that have pulled together and, and come with different criteria for their their financial investments and 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 um, how they spend their money at the big banks. But um, we also see big corporates that are already saying, you know, just offsetting carbon is not enough. If if we want to offset our ecological footprint as a company, we need to do much more than planting some trees in a place and actually it is a lot about should be a lot about natural regeneration as jean paul was saying and um and we see companies approaching us that say we would like to help rewilding by uh offsetting our entire ecological footprint and even have a nature positive impact through that and not just by planting some trees but by restoring nature at scale by uh, addressing through that climate adaptation and mitigation um, and also have a positive socioeconomic impact so and maybe these are the front runners. And you actually see that those companies are willing to do that, but we don't have the tools for it yet. So there is a, I think there is huge demand for it um, and it will grow. There's a huge investment potential for let's say nature-based solutions if there would be business models and if there would be investment opportunities for it. But the problem is the supply. And uh, you know, if you look at the forestry sector only, business models that deliver wilder or more natural forests but still you know uh, provide timber for the needs that we have those business models exist and and there's examples in in, in germany and, and different parts of the world 
uh, that show it, it is possible, but you know they don't make it as as opposed to the very commercial ones that just go for timber and nothing else. And all those core benefits of nature-based solutions or rewilding is something that needs to be taken into the equation. And it's um, it's really important that we we bring in the private sector because that will help us to scale up if we may if, if we are able to make that happen. Not only in forestry but also in the water sector, in the energy sector, and the fisheries, all of that. And um, and then when it comes to communities, of course, you know, this can only be done in the landscapes we were talking about. It's really important to work bottom up, have local ownership of, and leadership of these initiatives, support people, NGOs, local authorities with the, with, the, with the whole trajectory. And, you know, we talk about transition of landscapes that went in the wrong direction for, for many, many years. And it's not something that you can cover with a three or five year life project. This really needs long-term commitment because we're talking about transition of landscapes and you don't do that overnight. And um, so, uh, and, and then of course, the, the role of those communities and the people that live in these areas, in particular in Europe, it's all about coexistence. It's all about working with people that live in these landscapes and, and try to, to sort of develop these new development paths as opposed to just extracting and, um, and exploiting you know, the natural resources. And, um, so building these nature-based economies is something that uh, that definitely has to be done bottom up, but it needs to be uh, within an enabling environment from a policy policy perspective. But also, you know, there needs to be the financial uh, incentives, and and this is where some of these perverse EU subsidies still play a devastating role. For instance, on agriculture, which is just just driving more intensive land use and and you know, exactly the opposite direction. So there's huge challenges with the Green Deal if you look at some of the subsidies that are still being provided for the old way, so to speak. Yeah, so, uh, and then in, when it comes to indigenous people in Europe, um, we have the Sami people as an example, where we work in Swedish Lapland, and we're working very closely with them. And uh, they're also suffering from the pressures that we talk about here. And there's huge opportunity to work together in sort of reversing some of these trends by using the the knowledge and and the and, and the presence of, um, of of the indigenous people in this particular case, the Sami people, for instance. So yeah, I hope that covers a little bit your question, Carlos. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Franz. Uh, perhaps uh, Mina, could you add some comments on the? Uh, you are from a, a country where you have a, a large tradition of. Uh, uh, indigenous knowledge, the, the Andean communities, and uh, can you talk a little bit about this reality in in, in these uh, communities and how they are playing their role in uh, to restoration? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, you're right, uh, Carlos. In Bolivia, we have 36 recognized indigenous nations. Uh, all of them have uh, their own uh, culture, uh, and their own ways of uh, living in harmony with nature. Uh, specifically about uh, the Andean communities, I have been uh, fortunate enough to do my bachelor's thesis on indigenous uh, traditional knowledge on ecosystem restoration related to peat bogs, mm -hmm. uh, which are this special kind of wetlands that exist only in the Andean ecosystems. And when everything dries up, the animals just go there to feed uh, them. To, so they are crucial for the ecosystems. And the indigenous peoples that live there know how to restore uh, these peat bogs where they dry up. They actually studied the, the cycles of uh, dry and, and getting water again of these of these ecosystems. Like And they follow very complex cycles of like seven years and then five years and then seven years. It's super complicated, but I I realized that when I went to work with them, that they don't want to share this knowledge with scientists anymore. And that, and I think that that uh, rings uh, an alarm because uh, they are uh, tired that they don't get involved with like the, the, the scientists go, they ask them for a lot of data, they take this data, then publish an, a paper that is uh, written in English that they don't even translate the paper to Spanish to share with them. And then, and then don't recognize the the author rights, or 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 they don't even cite them when they gave most of the knowledge. So I think that one of the most important ways uh, to involve them is to 
to give them appropriate recognition uh, to, to share the knowledge that uh, has been generated through their consultations with them. So I think that uh, that is super important. I think that uh, in, a, in all the projects that are uh, regarding restoration, uh, it's also important to follow the principle of the free prior and informed consent from indigenous peoples and local communities. And, and that is one of the safeguards that is crucial to, to ensure that it's applied. Besides indigenous peoples, I think that some other uh, actors that are crucial for the implementation of restoration initiatives are women and young people. Uh, women hold also a lot of uh, knowledge on how to restore land, but they don't are they are not really involved in the projects. There is a lot of um, missing of gender equity and gender balance in the implementation of the projects, and furthermore, they face a lot of issues with land tenure rights. So how can they get active in the implementation of restoration activities if they don't even have the rights over the land they are occupying? And the, and that's the same case for indigenous people. Uh, young people face different issues. Young people have a lot of potential, especially for communication, but also for implementation. And, and they are actually getting really involved, but uh, we face a lot of, for example, tokenization. So there are many uh, decision-making processes where they only take you like at the last minute and without proper preparation or sharing enough information just to have the youth face at the event and say we, uh, we involve the youth appropriately, but this is not really true. Uh, and to say the least, a sector that is also, I wouldn't say marginalized, but sometimes not properly heard is science. So, we have a lot of uh, restoration initiatives that are not really listening to science. Uh, for example, in Bolivia, we faced it in 2019, uh, the forest fires uh, that affected a vast uh, portion of our ecosystems. We always have forest fires, but in 2019, it was really hard. We lost more than 5 million hectares of the Chiquitano dry forest. That is uh, an ecoregion that is endemic to Bolivia. Uh, we didn't really have time to, to get enough knowledge of it, so we don't know how many species were lost. Mm -hmm. And now there are a lot of initiatives on restoration, but a lot of them come from the private sector or from civil society organizations or even from the government are not, and are not really involving scientists that are capable of discern which types of restoration or initiatives we need. As uh, Jean Paul mentioned, if natural regeneration is in many cases the, the option that should be taken. But uh, we have a lot of initiatives that are, for example, bringing non native species and planting them, uh, and that carries a lot of risk. Or uh, there are uh, some initiatives that are called restoration, but actually they are uh, habilitating the land that was burned for agricultural purposes, and that is not restoration. So I also think that. Uh, the scientific community has to be really involved and heard in all of these initiatives at all levels. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, and also for bringing up the question of gender balance. Uh, that is uh, also uh, something that must be taken in account when you start those projects involving uh, the communities and, and uh, local knowledge. Uh, I have a question now for uh, uh, Jean Paul. Uh, thinking of multifunctional landscapes and seascapes, how can nature-based solutions be scaled up so that they not only provide ecosystem goods and service, but that can enhance biodiversity and significantly contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation, but also provide broader economic benefits, for example, through job creation. And I'll link that question, Jean Paul, with a question that was presented by Samantha Power. Uh, are there recent examples of where the private sector has invested in restoration, where the economics and not previously incentivized such investment? Which countries or companies are leading mobilize this type of private investment? Jepo, can you try to pack these two questions together? I think I can do the first one, maybe not the second one. But uh, for the first one, um, I really think that uh, nature-based solutions uh, is, is a way 
to plan what I'm, I'm calling healthier landscape. And those healthier landscape obviously are not only related to conserve biodiversity, but also to provide opportunities for uh, economic development. And when we talk, for example, about ecosystem service, so nature-based solutions are based on ecosystem service. Um, when you restore, you also increase several types of ecosystem service, such as, for example, pollination and pest control that we are studying now with coffee plantation. And so we have good uh, scientific evidence that pollination and pest control can increase coffee production, coffee yields in more than 20%, between 20 and 30%. So this is a clear indication uh, or a good data that should be shown to the, to the, to the farmers that restoration is not only a costly uh, uh, action that they have to do uh, in a common control or uh, ob obliged by law, but that they can have some benefits in their own activities, in their own economic activities. And uh, so we, we need to, to not only identify those win-win situation, but we need also to communicate, and it's not easy to communicate those, uh, those benefits. Uh, I, I, I had one year or two years ago uh, a meeting with coffee plantation, uh, coffee farmers, and when I present the data that uh, uh, force it can increase coffee yields, they didn't believe me. <laughs> and, uh, and it's very difficult to change culture. So, so as Mirna was just saying, uh, we, we have different ways to live in harmony with, with nature. And so we have all uh, cultural traditions uh, in the way that we interact and live with nature. And in some culture and some way to interact with nature is to put nature apart. And so it's very difficult to change this culture and to say nature can help you. And I really think that nature is part of the solution. So we need to, to have data to show, we, we need to communicate, we need to change behaviors. And it's not something that is uh, easy to, to be done. So uh, which are those healthier landscape? I think this is a, a, a huge cha a grand challenge that we do have, and it will change from landscape from landscape, so or in seascape or landscape, we will have different designs. And those designs are not only a balance between uh, natural native vegetation areas and uh, human dominated areas, but it's also about configuration, so how you arrange uh, those areas in space. For example, for the yellow fever, uh, we show that uh, forest edges just close to roads are uh, landscape features that facilitate yellow fever flows spread. So if we want to have landscape that avoid uh, those flows, so reducing the connectivity of the landscape for the yellow fever, we need to put roads apart from uh, forests and we need to have large blocks of forests that can act as barriers for the flows of yellow fever. So just to give one, one example. The second question, I think I will leave for someone else <laughs> to answer. Uh, perhaps uh, Lera, can you, uh, or Lera, both are working at the uh, global level. Uh, if there are any uh, companies or sectors of uh, the private sector that are uh, getting more involved in restoration and financing restoration projects. It's of your knowledge. Yeah, Lira, please. If I can reflect a little bit that I know that the, there are banks that are starting to aim to finance restoration. So there are several funds that are being set up by um, international banks for sustainable landscape management and the mechanism there is that they're looking for what they call a, a bankable project so a project where they can make a loan under favorable conditions and as um, 
the quid pro quo for that is that the project developer makes sure that there are good environmental and social benefits associated with the project that they're doing. So this could range from um, doing forest restoration in a way that will deliver some kind of financial benefit so that it's possible to pay back the bank for their loan, but also making sure that they're uh, respecting safeguards and they're quantifying the carbon and the biodiversity benefits from that, um, through to just doing agriculture in a better way. So uh, a good example to look at would be Rabobank, which has got a new fund that's, that's operating in this way. Yeah, uh, Gero, uh, there is a question on what tools are available to support countries to integrate nature and climate in policy making at different levels and scales? What are the suitable monitoring tools? What measures of success should be used? Uh, I'll, let, um, I'll let other here that are more qualified to answer about financial and regulatory instruments. But I can talk about uh, decision support tools that scientists uh, can, can provide. The amount of knowledge and, and data uh, that we have now on species and ecosystems, uh, how they respond to positive and negative human activities, for instance, habitat restoration and retroaction of chalk predators, uh, is astonishing now. <clears throat> for many regions of the world, we can now monitor live ecosystems uh, and their functioning. Uh, um, lie properly and, and, and timely. So, and this information can be uh, provided to support decision makers to allow them to basically uh, enact uh, virtually their, their policies, stress test their choices before they are implemented on the ground. I mentioned Bernardo Strasbourg paper, he has a decision support tool that just does just that allows you to simulate the consequence of your policy choice on restoration and conservation and see what are the outcome of this. Um, we need more of that. Uh, and also, um, we need more of outcome-based uh, uh, support. We need to stop uh, giving uh, uh, financial and regulatory support just to do things like more protected areas. We need to support the outcomes, the benefit that these yield, and, uh, and basically give payment for ecosystem services that are certified in some ways. Yeah, I would like to, to, to hear uh, Lara's comment on, on that too. But one of the things that I think both of you can also consider is that I don't know if it's the reality in other countries, but here in Brazil, we have uh, almost no study looking backwards, looking modeling backwards. If I hadn't taken that decision to protect areas 20 years ago, what could have happened? What is the success of doing that? Uh, and what is the success that I can plan for the future on decisions that I'm making now? Uh, but I first hear later on that, and then I come back to you, uh, Piero. The, the main thing the re I really want to say about this kind of scenario planning and spatial planning for restoration is that it gives us the ability to quantify what the benefit could be when you're talking at a global scale or at a national scale, but it doesn't deliver a plan. You know, the analysis is only an input to the plan. Um, and it's really important to, to recognize that because there'd been a, a lot of debate in the scientific community around, well, people have, like us are doing these fantastic, sophisticated spatial analyses that look at lots of biophysical factors, but they're not respecting the rights of the people in the lands that we're talking about. And then these analyses are absolutely not intended to tell you what to do in your place. They're only intended to show you what the potential benefits of those choices could be. So, you know, when you're deciding really for a place what actions you're going to take you need to think about what the priority benefits are in those places you need to involve all of the people who have got um, rights and interest in the landscape you need to use the data that really is relevant and fit for purpose for that place and to feed into the planning processes that are already going on in those places and what that will look like will vary from from country to country from sector to sector but i personally feel that participative planning is really important, not just to make sure that people's rights are respected, but also to get a good outcome for nature. If people are involved in the process of planning and ideally governing and implementing the restoration, 
then those people will have a stake in, in the success of the restoration and it's much more likely to have a good long-term future. And however much we as, as biodiversity experts try to integrate information on land designations or on planned infrastructure into our analysis, it's only by involving people who know the landscape and who work there that we're going to get any kind of a, a rational solution for that individual place. So I just wanted to make the pitch that there's a, there's a big distinction between these global spatial analyses and, and real action on the ground. Thank you. I think it's very interesting that uh, what, what you were saying is uh, very much uh, in line with uh, it is using all this nature future uh, framework for scenarios and, and where taking account people, nature, interests, so that you have to have everything coming to a good solution so that you will reach in 2050 living in harmony with nature. And this can only be done by using uh, the tools that uh, uh, people like uh, you at the uh, WCMC and others have been developing for this uh, scenarios uh, projection. Uh, I don't know if uh, Piero had any comment on, on, on that or or should we move for the next question? Because I think we are running out of time and Cornelia is looking very worried at me. So I, I'll put a last question to Mirna. Uh, it's, it's one, it's not an easy one, but uh, it's the last one. Uh, in an effort to balance emissions and to become carbon neutral, companies are increasingly looking towards investing in nature-based solutions such as restoration. How much of that can we consider is real and how much of that can be greenwashing? Well, thank you, Carlos. It is indeed a difficult question because uh, I don't know if that is quantified, uh, but, uh, but I do know that a lot of uh, these initiatives that are called restoration are not branded as restoration or nature-based solutions cannot qualify if they would follow, for example, the IUCN criteria or or the standards that are developed for from the Oxford initiatives on, on, on nature-based solutions. So other criteria, they wouldn't qualify, but they call it like that, they brand it like that. And, and that is a, an issue. I won't, I won't name certain companies, but uh, there are a lot of them, uh, especially the companies that are related to fossil fuels uh, are, are using these kind of schemes. So, what can we do about this? Uh, we recently had a panel discussion with representatives from uh, IUCN and uh, the Global Forest Coalition and the Tree World Network, which are the civil society organizations that work on these issues. And the, the director of the Global Forest Coalition, who is called Simon, uh, no, she's Simon Lavera, said something that really uh, sounded uh, interesting to me. Uh, that was a uh, non-binding safeguards are a contradiction by itself. So you cannot really have safeguards and call them safeguards if they, if they are not binding. So I think that uh, this is crucial. And if companies want to invest in nature-based solutions or restoration and brand their social and ecological responsibility initiatives like that, they should really follow certain safeguards or certain criteria. Otherwise, they shouldn't have the right to, to use this brand. Okay, thank you very much, Win. Uh, I'll hand over the, the floor to Cornelia uh, because our time is almost ending. Please, Cornelia. Yes, thank you very much, um, Carlos. And I'm really, I'm, I'm sorry that we're running out of time now because I mean, there's so much to be discussed. There are a lot of questions in the question box as well. There's a lot of going on in, in, in the discussion. And I think, I would actually like to invite everyone to actually, we'll post those questions on the LinkedIn group as well. And I invite everyone to actually come to the LinkedIn group and continue this discussion. And there's, there's so much that we can actually still learn from each other, um, discuss further. There are a few questions there that, that I think we, we need to think about more as like, um, Exactly. So, so we identifying the problem. Where are the solutions? Who do we need to involve? 
And then I've got those young people that are wanting to work in restoration and they can't find a job because there's no money there available. It's just scientific projects apparently that are working and we were working on a shoestring budget. So, so the, the thinking is like, what do we actually need to change to, to achieve that, that transformation and that restor broad restoration that really is, is necessary? And then also that juxtaposition between um, restoration of nature and simply the commodification of carbon services, carbon sequestration, the climate services, that we're actually really making sure that we're going in the right direction, um, restoring and preserving nature and not just making sure that we're planting trees to get the carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, I would actually very much like to thank all of you for being part of this discussion. It's been really interesting. I think we only scratched the surface of this and I hope that we can continue this discussion offline. I'm actually now thinking we should actually have a longer session on this maybe next year at the World Biodiversity Forum. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be in touch about this. And then the follow-up session next week is actually touching upon some of those economic issues that, that we, we also asked. So the um, opening address will be given by Sir Papa Daskupta. Um, he's just written the review on the economics of biodiversity. And Kanksha Katri from WEF from Work Economic Forum will moderate the session and hopefully we hear some feedback from, from actually banks and industry, how they're actually thinking about addressing the question. So thank you very much, everyone. Carlos, maybe some final words you'd like to say? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you all for the great session uh, we had. I agree entirely with uh, Cornelia. This is uh, a subject that needs more discussion and, and probably uh, more than one session uh, in the uh, program for, for the next year. Uh, restoration will be growing because uh, it's needed. We are now entering the decade of uh, restoration. Uh, so uh, perhaps it should be uh, one uh, major team for uh, the discussion next year. Uh, I think that the, the, thanks for the organization, for Cornelia to getting in touch with everyone, and also uh, for everyone to keep in time and make uh, contributions in a very objective and, and uh, a good way to, to bring up the discussion. Uh, I'm sorry that we cannot reply all the questions that have been made uh, through the chat, uh, but as Cornelia said, that we are going to, uh, to work on that. So uh, I don't know where you are in the world, but uh, have a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. <laughs> uh, although it's uh, quite uh, two o'clock p.m. in Brazil, now I'm going to have lunch because this is started right at half past twelve. So I think Jan Po is also going to have his lunch, and Mirna also because we are all in a different uh, time scale. Thank you, Cornelia. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Nice to meet you.